So hi, I'm Kathy Fleischer. I'm the editor of the Principles in Practice imprint for the National Council of Teachers of English Books. And we're happy today because we're going to talk about Jennifer Bueller's new book, Teaching Reading with YA Literature, Complex Texts, Complex Lies. And so we're really delighted that Jennifer is here. Jennifer is a professor at St. Louis University. She's the president of Allen. Um, for many years, she's done text messages to Read, Write, Think, which are wonderful podcasts about young adult literature. Um, and we are delighted that this book is out. So welcome for this. Um, Jennifer has brought along a couple of her friends, um, which we're also super excited about. We have Matt Dela Pena, who's the author of so many young adult books, um, as well as um, a children's book that won the Newbery Award last year. Congratulations on that. Beautiful book. Um, and A.S. King, who again is the author of many young adult books. Um, and so many honors that you have as well. So, but one in the Amelia uh, Elizabeth Walden Award. So, um, this is great. I'm super excited to have them here because if I could be my two favorite young adult authors, they're right here well, in front of me. So, I'm really happy about this. I grew up as a reader of young adult literature. Those books meant a lot to me, and they really helped me to think about the world and myself. And they were not the books that I read in school. Um, I felt that I got permission to bring those books into my classroom as an early career teacher when I read Linda Reef and Nancy Atwell. But like Reef and Atwell, I really only knew to create classroom libraries. Well, they knew more than I did, but <laughs> as a beginner, I knew to create a classroom library and I knew to cultivate reading choice and to help kids find identities as readers. But what I really didn't know is how to take teaching young adult literature to the next level. So. It was really either one option or another. Students choosing books from a classroom library or students reading a young adult novel as a whole class study in a way that didn't look any different than the way we would read a piece of classic young adult literature. So I was given the opportunity to think about what a more complicated way or more a visionary way of teaching young adult literature might be and you called me to think about what would a pedagogy of these books look like? Can we conceptualize that? And can we find teachers out in the world who are teaching these books who could help illustrate what a more thoughtful and sophisticated why a pedagogy could be? So those are some of the roots of the book, and um, the hope is that it calls teachers to feel like they not only can use these books in the classroom, but they can keep using them in more and more interesting and effective ways. you suggest in your book is right now there's such an emphasis on text complexity. We see that term everywhere for teachers, but um, it's pretty reductive in that it mostly talks about lexicon scores and books are named as whether they're complex enough based on that. So, but in this, in your book, you talk about two different ways of thinking about complexity, finding complexity and making complexity. Um, and in that first kind of finding complexity, you do a beautiful analysis of two uh, well-known YA books, We Were Here by Matt, and Asset Passengers by Amy um, as examples of YA texts that really, they are extremely complex in and of themselves. So I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about this notion of text complexity and why you selected these two books in particular to illustrate that. Okay, so first of all, it seemed really crucial to make the case that the books are complex because um, a lot of people don't believe that. People base their opinions on young adult literature on the latest bestseller or what is being said in popular culture about the books, and they've not read them. So it's first just crucial to make the case that there is complexity there, then to illustrate what complexity can mean beyond some kind of numeric measure. You know, our field is being driven by lexile levels as one catchphrase, um, by common core, meaning we're being being limited in the ways that we're invited to think about text and use text. So I wanted to push back on all of that. Um, and I thought, what do I do as a reader when I'm engaged in a book that I think is great, that is challenging me in my mind and moving me in my heart? I'm engaging in it as a text, and I'm bringing parts of my own story and experience and questioning to the text. So those were pieces of how the finding complexity and making complexity framework came into being. 
I'm an English teacher and I'm a student of English, so I know how to look at a text and examine it for stylistic features and content and theme. And I know that I'm a reader who's always making meaning of books based on my context, events happening in the world, conversations I'm having with my family and friends and colleagues, my past experiences as a reader. So I wanted to name all of that as stuff that counts and stuff that matters more than what a computer program says about the vocabulary or the sentence structure of a text, okay? Um, now, I thought we talked as we worked on this book together. That argument will really come home if I can ground it in two particular texts. So I chose, we were here, and I chose Ask the Passengers because I've taught those books in my young adult literature class lots of times. I began teaching those books in my young adult literature class, which is a class that serves college students now, because I love them. They were books that I knew had mattered to me, and I would go to the mat for those books because of the because of the quality of them and because of the ideas they explored. Unpacking where I found complexity in them was probably my favorite part of writing this whole book. That was the chapter that I actually wrote the fastest and with the most confidence and pleasure because it was a chance to dig into these stories. So We Were Here is a book about group home kids, three of them, who leave their group home and try to figure out who they are in a world that's labeled them as essentially throwaways, kids that have messed up. Um, they're journeying to Mexico in hopes of starting a new life, but they're journeying to hopefully find a way to um, make sense of what they've done and find a way, if, if it's possible, to forgive themselves and move on. Um, what I love about We Were Here is that it's written in the form of journal entries. The voice in the book is extremely powerful. Um, you can hear this kid, Miguel's voice. He is a reader. So I did a lot of work analyzing Miguel's voice and the way he talks and the figurative language he uses, which is powerful. Um, it was a real pleasure to think about how his decision to steal some books from the group home when he leaves plays a part in him figuring out what his story is. So, um, so that's a little bit about the substance of the book and the style of it. Um, one more layer, there's a deep amount of moral complexity in this book, and there's a line that I remember reading the very first time I read the book that I've paused on ever since in each rereading. And it's the line about, people think there's this line that you can cross, my favorite line in the book. Yeah, <laughs> it, it comes up every year. I never have to prompt students to find that line. They always find it. But I think there's this line that you can cross, like something that separates good people from bad people. There is no line. There is no line. So the, the ability to have conversations about um, morality, existentialism, there's so much that we can find and make and we were here. So there's that book. And there's more to say, but that's, that's <laughs> a placeholder for that book. And then Ask the Passengers. So another book that I love because of the voice of the character and the sensibility of the character. Astrid is a girl who's trying to figure out her sexuality, but that's also in the context of trying out, trying to figure out what it means to be kind of trapped in a small town. A uh, pretty um, unforgiving small town, really judgmental small town. Um, sort of trapped in a family that's struggling to be connected and to um, care about each other. Um, Astrid is asking a lot of questions about what is identity and what is truth, but she's drawing on Greek philosophy to help her do it. I love this. She is taking a humanities class, and the questions that she's being invited to think about in humanities class take the book to a meta level. Um, is motion possible? What does it mean to live in a cave? Plato's <laughs> allegory of the cave? I mean, these are both authors that are drawing on classics to tell the stories of teenagers. Um, but what I especially love about Past the Passengers are two more layers. One is that Astrid is channeling 
and Socrates to help her on her journey. She is encountering him in a magical realism way. She nicknames him Frank S. because she wants to feel close to him. He gives her comfort. He shows up in key moments in her life. Um, so how amazing is that? To find magical realism in a young adult novel and a teenager whose muse or whose comfort figure is Socrates. Um, and last but not least, she's, she's sending up love to passengers on airplanes that fly overhead because she doesn't really have a place on the ground in her everyday life to express love. That piece, I always ask my students, what would the book lose? Would the book be different if there weren't vignettes that depict passengers in airplanes traveling overhead and brief snippets of their stories? And we have great conversations about how that layer makes the book even more universal than it would otherwise be. So see how much there is there to unpack? I can't say it quickly because there's so many layers. That's complexity. We think as teachers a lot about text complexity, but do you as authors think about that when you're writing for teens? Um, do you see your own books as complex in these ways? And do you think about that when you're writing? I mean, I'm starting to say, I mean, for me, the most important thing is layers. Like, if there are no layers, then there's less chance that things are going to resonate long after a reader leaves the book. And I will say this, like, just hearing you break that down, is, makes me actually a little emotional because it's an honor to have somebody actually explore all the layers in your work. There's nothing that you could do that's more complimentary. And do you feel that? I agree because, well, well, I think that our experience is often, even though we talk to teachers who are, you know, do have complex ideas about our books, um, you really only get the basics like, oh, this is for me with Acid Passengers, so this is your, this is your gay book. Yeah. I was like, well, no, uh, no, it's not quite that. And so to hear you break that down, yeah, absolutely emotional. And do, you know, do I think about it when, when we write? I, I find it, I can't write just a straight up book. When I find I get bored, I think. Um, and I, I write books uh, the way they come to me, right? So I don't plan anything ever. So as they come, so suddenly, Frank, show, well, suddenly Socrates shows up and she thinks he should have a first name because it's warm, you know, it's warmer. And so she gives him one. Um, and then, then it just kind of takes on a life of its own. Um, but I think, I think maybe it's just this weird, com well, I find teens very complex yeah. and I find the teen experience complex and we're complex people. So, and life is complex. So why would we, why would we dilute that experience because we've been told that teens aren't that complex. In actual fact, I think sometimes they're more complex than adults. Yeah, and I think one more thing that comes to mind for me is, you know, different readers are bringing different tools to a book. And you don't want to just have a couple things going on the surface stuff. You want the best reader to be able to find even more layers of, of additional reads. And, you know, I'll be honest, like, I read a lot of adult novels. I bet you do too. But guess what? My favorite YA novels are it's funny because we both read the books that you you, yeah. uh, you worked with, and well, why is Amy one of my favorite authors? Because of the layers. Okay. Yeah, and, and, I, and we were here. It's like my, and I know I'm fancy your other books, but that's yeah. like the book. That's like the one that has you know, lights around the novel. <laughs> I love that book. So it's interesting as readers, we're looking for the complexity too. We're looking for the same thing. Yeah. And I think the last thing that, that comes to mind is, I think there's what the book is about, and then there's what the book is. Yeah. And not everybody can get to the really part, you know? Yeah, yeah I yeah. agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. I go into schools um, all year long. I talk to teenagers and I explain to them that, you know, really the term teenager wasn't really in popular use until the early 1950s, and before that, y'all were just human beings. <laughs> um, and, you know, but for me, yeah, I mean, it's not just the books that they'll bash, they'll bash anything kids do. Uh, the, oh, you're walking with your phone, you're a millennial, you know, or if you're, I, I was just called a millennial, uh, which is awesome. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it pulls it's that out. This is why I'm awesome. <laughs> it's a bit more this is a, yeah, anyway. But, um, but yeah, I find that, you know, first of all, I think we greatly underestimate teenagers in our society. We greatly underestimate them. And I think that that leads to them greatly undervaluing themselves. 
Um, and I think that that's a shame because I find teenagers to have this fantastic open mind and adults are asking them to box their mind and become an adult. And how do you define that? I'm an adult. Mm -hmm. You know, I was roller skating only yesterday. Um, am I allowed to do that? I'm not sure. I think I am as an adult. But this is this, is this idea that, that there is a line. Mm -hmm. There's a line between what a teen is and what an adult is. And, and it's, it's not really true because I do things that teenagers do, and I also did things as, that adults did when I was a teenager. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's so cut and dry the way we the way we look at teens. Um, but for the most part, we roll our eyes at them all the time. I mean, that is the number one thing. And as you know, as as a mother, I, every time it was like, just wait till they're teenagers. And I thought, are they going to explode? <laughs> there, I can tell you for a fact, so far. No child exploding in my house. In fact, they just get more and more exciting as individuals. Like they're just, it's it's unbelievable. But instead, we have this very negative attitude toward teenagers and anything that has to do with them. Really, I mean, you know, say say the word Twilight movie to any adult, and they'll go, ah. yeah. you know, that, or I mean, that's that's a bad example. But I'm trying to think of anything else that, that would be you know teen related. Um, so, yeah, I do I do think so. I mean. Um, I remember my mom yelling at me because I used to write on my arm. Okay, because we all wrote on our arms once, or our hands. And then my kid comes home and she's rich. She's like, I'm like, those are awesome, because I feel like that's how she's expressing herself. I don't know, you know. But we just we move past it, and we move past it very quickly. Um, I watched it happen with two, uh, a sister and brother I know. Um, she was about three years older than him. The minute she hit 21, she looked down on 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then so then. Uh, Teenagers, and I'm like, you were just, a <laughs> and you're only, you know, I, but it's 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 just how it goes. We're taught that we're an adult now. We have a job now. We have a degree now, or whatever yeah. it is that, that that level is. But outside of that, I think that I think that teenagers greatly undervalue themselves because of how we look at them, yeah. and I think that's a shame. And I think that going into books, that's why I tend to, to like to challenge and have layers and, and and challenge teen readers because you know some of my books are more challenging for adults than they are for teens. Mm -hmm. I've had that. I've had that situation, you know. And and, and the teens are like, I love this book, and the, and the teachers like, I kid, my kids will never understand this book. And I'm thinking, what are you saying? What are you saying about you? And what are you saying about the book? And what are you saying about your students? If you say that, that they'll never understand it, and in actual fact, they understand it on a, on a more complex level. Yeah. I think you write a book and you do the best you can with it and you, you try to put as much stuff in it as possible and try to be as authentic as possible um, and, and to tell the best story. And then the reader comes along and does the rest of the work. So when, when a kid says that book, book saved my life, it's not necessarily true. They're actually giving the writer too much credit in my opinion because what they're really doing is they're saving themselves by using your book as a tool. And there's so much of their flesh in the margins of your book. They're the ones making it so important to them. But I will say this, I think representation is incredibly important because of this. Um, I recently was at a school and uh, these two boys that were like huge, huge readers, um, you know, they, they've been introduced to my book, so they read them all. And I videoed them and I said, because they were telling me that you know seeing themselves in a book was important. And I said, why? And they told me another book that they loved. But they said, I wasn't a part of that world. I love the book and I love it and I love talking about it, but I wasn't a part of it. So when I read a book that had somebody like me in it, there was a little something extra. And then I was like, you know what? Maybe that's the best definition of, of the uh, necessity for diverse, diverse characters in literature there's a little something extra to it. It's also an invitation. Um, so yeah, I think when you only have a few options on the bookshelf that it's, it's kind of like you are in on I think it's a little something extra. And I think that goes a long way. No, it's interesting because I think that goes even beyond diversity because I don't know if you remember the very first time I met you, I was telling you about how my son decided oh, that Ball the Line yeah, yeah, yeah. was like the true story of basketball. You know, yeah. that book set is for this gritty setting, and my son's like this, you know, white kid in suburban, you know, yeah. Michigan. But he found it something extra in that because he felt it depicted who he 
how he envisioned himself at the time. So you know some interesting thing about all the time. There's so much slay that if you are a true baller and, a, and you hoop, you get it on a whole other level. And that is, that is just yeah, like, yeah. as a former baller. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's and a totally different story for ball. Yeah. You not fully get those things, and therefore it becomes the kids' book and not the teacher's book. Oh, and, yeah. and I think that's there's something to that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. One of my intellectual heroes has been Patty Campbell, a longtime critic and writer in the field of YA lit. And she wrote a piece a long time ago that tried to distill what are the essences of YA lit. So she talked about style, but she also talked about a core substance in YA lit is a central question that every YA book asks. And that is, in her words, who am I and what am I going to do about it? And I tell my students that one of the things that keeps me reading these books year after year with um, pretty much unflagging passion and commitment is a belief in the importance of that question. For teenagers, but also for me, I'm continuing to ask that question in my own life. Who am I? Because the answer keeps having more layers to it. Um, and the answer changes as I grow and change. And what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do with my privilege or my platform? What am I going to do if um, I read a book and I see myself through the eyes of a kid on the margins? Mm -hmm. What can my college students do, for example, because they're usually reading from a place of privilege? Um, and what does it mean to dignify the experience of coming into adulthood by centering it around the importance of that question, I think Wiley Lit provides a space for all of that. So it's a matter of respecting these books is a gesture toward respecting teenagers and the integrity of that work. Yeah, I think sometimes with the canon, what's the difference between the canon and the YA? There's been more respect over the course of years and years toward those books, so now they become the canon. So the more we get you know, scholars looking at quality YA and really unpacking it, that's going to mean that those, those uh, resources are available and then teachers can find them. I feel like some teachers who, who only lean on the canon, at the end of the day, isn't that kind of lazy? You know? It's a very static but The canon to me is very static. I, I, I was writing a speech last year and I went to so many different school websites all over the country and looked at their reading lists for the certain age groups. Um, and it was the same books over and over yeah. and over again. It was very static. Um, and it hadn't changed since my day. And there are books there that haven't changed since my mother's day. And she graduated in 56. So um, it was it kind of, it made me, I don't understand why there's a block there. I think it is because of the respect. And it's the lack of respect for teenagers and the lack of respect for the teenage experience out there without, um, uh, out there without any apology, I think. Um, and I think that uh, perhaps teachers or adults would prefer teenagers apologize for just the experience that they're going through, as if we haven't done it ourselves, and as if we aren't continuing to do it. Because I mean, my books wouldn't exist if I wasn't continually growing. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, that you have to continually grow. My, my books are always just little pieces of me at that time. People say, do you, do you think back to your teen years to write your books? I'm like, no, I'm thinking back to you. I'm dealing with it right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of it has to do with it. I think the canon is static at the moment, and if there was a way we could we could start putting, you know, new books in there, I I don't know how to do it. You brought up something um, that earlier that makes me think of why I did it. You said we didn't call teenagers teenagers until fairly early right, early fifties, and we also didn't call why why correct until fairly you know. Right. Even more recently. So yeah. that kind of might factor into that labeling of a yep. certain type of literature. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, as authors, I think we get this thing as well, regardless of this. There's, you know, if you think about it, look at the adult shelves. The adult shelves have so many different genres, exactly. have so many different things. Um, whereas if, if we use young adults as a genre label, 
then everything's fitting in there. Horror, romance, right. literary, um, you know, surrealism, whatever it is, all this stuff is fitting into the same thing. And I don't know if that does it justice or not. And I don't think any bookstores are going to, you know, make their YAs yeah. <laughs> that um, diverse. But as teachers, I think in classrooms, we can we can do so that. Um, but yeah. Uh, can I add a couple of things? Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, so I'm trying to think back to the points I want to connect to. One is about canons. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, I'll say it, a laziness, yeah. if that's all you um, care to teach. But it may also be um, a fear of taking a risk mm -hmm. and a, a, a lack of a fully realized vision. And I think a couple of those pieces, risk and vision, um, are impacted by lack of a vocabulary for talking about these books. And so the reason I thought to bring this into the conversation is when you said um, it helps so much when people unpack what's in these mm -hmm. texts, um, it helps so much when we start to get critical writing around young adult literature and individual books, um, because I feel like that gives us a language for saying what these books contain, mm -hmm. what they aspire to do, yep. um, where the richness is in them. Is in them. And um, absent that language and that an external framework, it can be really hard on your own to come up with it. And I'm speaking from my own experience as a teacher. I um, have said this about Patty Campbell's influence on me. I didn't realize the importance of critical writing because the only critical writing I had seen as a high school and college student was about the classics mm -hmm. until I saw critical writing about literature applied to YA and then began to aspire to do that because I a light bulb came on that if, if I can make that contribution, it would further bolster um, the evidence yeah. that the books are good. Uh, so there's that. Just having a framework and a language for talking. When you're busy just discovering what the field contains, mm -hmm. and that goes back to why it is a genre, or I like to talk about why it is a field. It's a field of study. It's a field of literature with lots of layers, lots of genres in it. Um, its own history, and um, once we start to lay that out, um, it's a way to say that YA has its own story and its own evolving canon, the way classic literature has its own story, its own history, and its own evolved canon. And it's a newer field, yeah. if it's a field, because then you know, more and more critical writing will be done in the years to come, Absolutely. and so then it will be accessible for teachers, right? There will, there will be more of a comfort. Yeah, and I think the more we can put all this stuff in dialogue with its with itself, or pieces in dialogue with each other, that we have a classical canon, yeah. and we have an evolving YD canon, yeah, and those, they're not separate. It's not either one, right? They're yeah. in dialogue with each other, we can put books in conversation with each other, so all those things offer up more possibilities. You know, way back when, and I've been playing for, for many years, when you were teaching high school, when you started this young adult reading group with parents. Oh, so parents so could, she's really smart. <laughs> that's really There's great. lots of ideas like that in the book. Yeah. But I mean, that's a, it's a, it was like such a cool thing because it got them to start having more familiarity. So I think it's both sort of the critical analysis of it that makes it seem more of a field and more of a perspective field, but it's also really trying to get the, this, these books in the hands of people who are the decision makers yeah. or who can influence the decision makers, right? So if parents know about it or if parents are then able to say to administrators, these should be yes. in the classroom because these are really good books and impact the kids. So yeah. I think there's some of that going on too. Yeah. And so there's the parents' first first experience as a reader discovering what the books have to yeah. offer. And then what I learned about the failure of the binary of there's either workshop or there's whole class units of study. Um, what about just the dialogue that takes place when we kind of free ourselves up from a, a packaged approach to what the use of the books can look like? If a parent has a conversation with their kid that the book makes possible, that starts to open up um, a vision for what kind of conversations their kid might be able to have in school with other kids and with a thoughtful adult that wouldn't otherwise be possible if we were just trooping through literary terms or all reading in isolation books that we've chosen individually.
don't know why it feels very fresh, and I think it's because it's it's taking in world events that are happening now. Yeah. And so kids are responding to that and think about those conversations that are coming up that might not be coming up with Japan in all lives because those same issues weren't as urgent back then or even existed back then. It's a new world. And I think YA is, is looking at that new world. You know? Or how YA can help us understand the worlds that we're that we're seeing in the canonical yes. pieces too. To that one. Like this the things that repeat and repeat and repeat exactly. and repeat. Um, it's in this way now, but look how it was then. Absolutely. And then the passengers, it's one of those things that almost um, in many of my books I, I discuss white fear and white hate mm -hmm. because I grew up surrounded by it and I've been trying to figure it out my whole life. Um, and to me, it's my way of being able to talk to maybe reach one of those kids who's in one of those homes who, you know, who's been bred in this way to maybe. Yeah. Just flip that switch. Yeah. Just go. Oh, this looks, you know, appalling. Let's let's look at the other way around. You know, to do that. Um, and that's it. It's a new world. We have to try and figure out our own way to, mm -hmm. to kind of help because I can't uh, not help. There's a, there's a line at the very beginning of Ask the Passengers where Astrid is um, laid out like. They say this in my town, and they say that in my town, and the very end of that chapter is. Maybe it's like this in your town too, yeah. which is a pretty cool meta moment. Yeah. And that's what these books invite. Like, huh, I wonder if I am living in this kind of world, or I wonder if um, I am implicated in this. Yeah, well, at that age, I mean, at that age, I knew a bit. I definitely knew. Um, but I didn't really know, no, until I was at 19 to 20, and was really looking around and going, wow. Um, and, uh, and so maybe we can discover this you know, earlier and that kind of thing. And I think one of the, you know, we were talking about layers earlier. I think the best way as a writer to create these layers that are explored in this book is to just focus on asking questions and exploration as a writer and not looking to provide answers. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, the key word in that sentence is maybe. Mm -hmm. She doesn't know for sure, but she's starting to go, she's questioning it. Wait, maybe, maybe it's like that for you too, you know? So not preaching yeah. to them, give them the answer, but that is the, thinking, the, like, let's well, yeah. engage you. Yeah, my nine-year-old nine wouldn't listen to you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's oh, yeah. Sure. That's <laughs> really true. They did. They've got, they've got radar like nothing else, yeah. and they don't. But that's, someone asked me the other day, why are you so serious? I'm like, I'm not so serious. I'm real. <laughs> and they were like, well, it was a friend of mine who's real. And I was like, well, what is your problem with me being real? Well, they're teenagers. And I'm like, that's your problem. It's not the real, it's the fact that you think teenagers can't be real. Those are the most real people on earth because they haven't layered themselves in, I don't know, yeah. bubble wrap, say, adult bubble wrap. Uh, what's your hope for a teacher who reads this book? Okay. What would you like them to get out of it? I guess it comes down to two things. Um, one is fuel. If a teacher comes to this topic thinking, I do use these books in the classroom, there's more evidence that you can take to bolster your case. Um, another hope is, the, the corollary to that is, I hope the book provides vision and an invitation for new possibilities, because I'll tell you, writing the book was really responding to a call to figure out for myself what more was possible for these books in the lives of teens and the lives of teachers and classrooms. And so I tried to lay out some new ideas about what else we could be doing with these books that um, stretches teenagers and stretches our vision of what our work in the English classroom is for. So I really hope that the books bolster the cause um, and also invite teachers to think beyond what, what they're already doing or what's been offered to them by their administrators for the package curriculum they've been handed.